դրոշմը դիր աստվածագի, վիր հերս է ժայրերը լեկ լույսով ներգի, դուր որնակը դուր ծեղի դմտիր, ծրտերը խեղ արդում խուվերք լույսով սպեղի, At the crossroads of east and west lies Asia Minor, bordered to the north by the Caucasian Plateau. 
Thousands of years ago, an Indo-European nation emerged, calling themselves Armenians. By the Golden Age of Rome, Armenia was a revered ally, or a feared enemy. Being on the paths of trade and war was a blessing and a curse. Armenia was under constant threat of attack. Yet neither Alexander the Great nor any other conqueror could subjugate this stubborn people. As time went on, Armenia was caught between Rome and its great enemy, Persia. Each would use Armenia as a buffer against its rival. Great cities were laid waste time and again. Armenian kings rose to power through a combination of skillful maneuvering and outright warfare. Tigran the Great allied himself with Rome's enemies and extended his empire from the Caspian to the Mediterranean. Rome sent its finest generals against him before he was defeated. This was the end of a golden age for Tigran's people. Like the Romans and the Greeks, the Armenians had their pantheon of ancient gods. Among the nobility, which had been seeded by Persian aristocracy, the monotheistic faith known as Zoroastrianism was also common. But the world was in a time of change again, and merchants traveling to the great centers of trade in the Middle East came into contact with a new idea. A faith that would soon shape the identity of their kinsmen. By the 4th century AD, Armenia had been the first to adopt Christianity as its official religion, even before Constantine tolerated it within the Roman Empire. This new religious identity demanded translation of the scriptures into the language of the people. And for this task, known to scholars as the Queen of Translations, an alphabet was invented. This was a new golden age. A century later, the people of Asia Minor were caught again between the Roman and Persian worlds. The Persian Shah sought to strengthen his hold over his empire by forcing all Christians to renounce their faith and adopt Zoroastrianism, the Persian religion. This enraged the Armenian nobility. Abandoned by Byzantium, a general named Vartan Mamagonian led his people in revolt. It was Armenia's first test as a Christian nation. Facing superior odds, Vartan and his nobles were killed. Their wives carried on the fight. Eventually tiring of war, the Persian court negotiated a truce and allowed freedom of religion. But soon Persia itself would fall under the waves of invasions from the east. Each invader brought greater devastation. The centuries that followed wore away the ancient homeland. Many fled west to the Byzantine Empire. By the medieval age, Byzantium weakened, and the kingdom of Cilicia emerged and prospered. Again, this would only last for a time. For yet another invasion would strike Byzantium. Asia Minor would soon fall under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. In theory, Islamic law granted Christians and Jews a certain amount of freedom. The Ottomans were shrewd in managing their multi-ethnic empire. But as time went on, Ottoman leaders grew corrupt and minorities received harsh treatment. Christian Armenians and Greeks were prohibited from carrying arms or serving in the military. Non-Muslims had to pay special taxes and their word was not admissible in court. 
Abdul Hamid came into power at a time when minorities were clamoring for reforms. He responded in kind and earned the title the Red Sultan. Sultan Hamid encouraged a climate of fear. Kurdish tribesmen were given license to commit atrocities. There were massacres. And all the while, the victims were prohibited from carrying arms in self-defense. Meanwhile, across the border with Russia was an ancient enclave of Christian Armenians. It was a land of lush peaks and fertile valleys. Its name, loosely translated, means dark forest in the mountains. The ancient clan of Armenians who lived here ruled themselves. Around them lived the Tatars, or Azerbaijanis, a Turkic people. The land of Azerbaijan itself had oil. Under the Russians, many Armenians moved to the capital, Baku, and worked its oil fields. At the turn of the 20th century, Russia was playing the Azeris and Armenians living in Baku against each other. And there were outbursts of ethnic violence. At about this time, a progressive reformist party, popularly known as the Young Turks, deposed Abdul Hamid. Minorities were promised better treatment. This experiment was doomed to fail. When Turkey entered the First World War as Germany's ally, it turned on its minorities. Of these, Armenians were the hardest hit. Under the pretext of national safety, an ancient people was driven from its historic homeland. Anyone of influence was rounded up and executed. Those in the army were stripped of their weapons and reassigned to labor battalions. In a systematic fashion, old men, women, and children were forced to march through deserts where they would be subject to every depredation imaginable. Although there was mounting international protests against the atrocities, the world was at war and did nothing. It was expedient to wipe out an entire nation. There were pockets of resistance, but the life of a resistance fighter could be counted in days. Word of a mass extermination was starting to spread. The Armenian population of Van, learning of an impending attack by the Ottoman military, struck first at the Turkish garrison within its walls. Their defense of Van, however, would be abandoned and many died during a devastating exodus to Russian Armenia. In 1918, the Ottoman Empire sent its army into Russian territory to finish the job. They were stopped within sight of the Armenian capital and driven back. Within a month, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan had declared themselves republics. When Turkey surrendered to the Allies at the close of World War I, the West was very aware of the fate of Turkey's Armenian population. The young Turks, for their part, had fled their country, condemned for their crimes by their own courts. The survivors of the 20th century's first genocide were not safe yet. As the political climate changed again, Turkish nationalism found its new champion. Under Kemal Atatürk, the persecutions were rekindled. Europe abandoned the Christians of Anatolia, and many who had returned to their homes were driven out of the country. As part of a secret deal, Ataturk sent his forces against the young Armenian Republic, just as the Bolsheviks gained momentum in the Caucasus. Armenia was a land of famine and poverty. She could do nothing but surrender to communist control. Once he had subjugated the Caucasus, 
the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin, redrew its borders. Countries were checkerboarded within each other. The Armenians of Karabakh were cut off and placed within Azerbaijan. In the decades that followed, the Armenian population of Turkey was a shadow of its historic self. Turkish nationalists denied the genocide had ever taken place. Russian Armenia was ruled by the Soviets, who tried to suppress its religion and identity. And most other Armenians were scattered to the wind. By the late 1980s, as the Soviet Union began to come apart, Armenian demonstrators protested Azeri and Russian oppression. Their call was for full independence and that Nagorno-Karabakh be liberated from Azeri rule. The parliament of Karabakh voted itself an independent republic. A few days later, in the Azeri city of Sumgait, Azeri mobs rampaged against the Armenians living there as the Soviet military stood by. Nature added its own touch. Within months, a devastating earthquake leveled cities and killed tens of thousands within Armenia itself. The Soviets did what little they could to help, but they could not stop Turkey and Azerbaijan from blocking relief missions from the outside world. Frustration boiled over. Skirmishes erupted in Garapag itself. Azeri refugee mobs, driven out by the instability, attacked the Armenians of Baku. The pogroms again raged on unchecked. Hundreds were killed, and both nations experienced a mass exodus. Escalating its ethnic purging, Azerbaijan launched a full invasion of Garapag. Initially helped by Russian forces, Azerbaijan occupied most of the enclave and surrounded the capital. Stepanakert was bombed mercilessly. 1993, however, saw the tides change. The Russians had stopped supporting Azerbaijan. The Armenians of Karabakh had reorganized. Farmers had been molded into a trained military. A vital corridor to Armenia was reopened. Azerbaijan persisted and relaunched its campaign. Foreign mercenaries were hired to fly bombing missions. Conscripts were herded into battle by Mujahideen. By 1994, tens of thousands were dead and over a million were refugees. Azerbaijan had lost control of the situation, and Armenian forces were pushing into Azerbaijan itself in a bloody gambit to secure a buffer zone. And high in the mountains to the north, Armenian partisans stared down a superior Azeri force that still occupied their village of Gulistan. Here, in these dark forests, was a theater of perpetual war.
Oh, my God. 